stress again, the open math lab is available to you. Great place up to 11 o'clock at night. You won't be talking to me at 11 o'clock at night. But there are people there that are trained and uh, will be working with you in the evening if you need that help. Okay, so any questions? Anything I could go? No? Quiet today, huh? I detected that in my 8 o'clock class. That there was some celebration last night. Yeah, I can tell those days. After you've taught at VMI for a while, you know when there's been sweat parties. We earn our pay those days. <clears throat> All right. That's your quiz on one point, or chap chapter one. There's not going to be a quiz on chapter two, but there's going to be a graded assignment. <coughs> I'll explain it to you now. This is up on Angel, this document. And it will be due next Wednesday, start the class. And we'll, we've been practicing this in the previous lecture, and we're going to practice this tomorrow, uh, some more today. And the whole goal is, as I explained, is I'm not as interested in having you create these statistical graphs. There's lots of tools that do that. I am very interested in having you interpret them and be able to critique them. So what you will do is you'll select a, a statistical table or graph, your choice. And there are lots of them out there. Let me do a quick example here. Uh, I'll show you how I, how I find mine. And anybody here interested in, let's say, uh, <coughs> football statistics. And we look at images. And I see bar charts. I see, I might look, look careful there, <coughs> scatter plots. There are all kinds of opportunities. There's one. Find something that interests you. Sports, politics, economics, don't care. There's lots out there, and they're easy to find. And I want you to write a, uh, it be a one page assignment. <coughs> Front and back, type. You're all proficient at MS Word or whatever your choice is, so you can find your graphic on the web, copy it, insert it in your document. And then you're going to talk about it. You're going to explain, first of all, what is it? Is it a bar chart? Is it a histogram? Is it a frequency polygram? What's the message that you think is trying to be conveyed here statistically? Right. And then you're going to get to be a critic. Did they do a good job? You might, you might pick intentionally a graph that does a, you think a lousy job. Criticize it, that's fine. Or you might pick an excellent example and say, wow, this is wonderful. That's fine too. Mostly I want to see some thought processes behind it. If you think it's bad, you're going to have to tell me why. If you think it's wonderful, tell me why you think it's wonderful. The paper will just be a very simple outline. I want everyone to provide an overview. <coughs> Identify the type of graph, explain in your words what it's displaying. <coughs> and the second part, interpretation, and consider these kinds of questions. And then in the third part, your critique. Well, we practiced this some on Friday, didn't we? We're going to do it mostly today for another 20 minutes or so. We're just going to do examples and uh, see how they are good examples of statistical graphs or maybe misleading, poor examples. It's a work for grade. You cannot receive any help from another cadet, from an instructor for the Open Math Lab in creating this, doing your analysis. Writing is important to me. I consider this a technical writing assignment. So go ahead and use the, uh, the writing center to prove your writing, that's fine but all the content has to be yours. 
When's the uh, due date for this? Uh? It's next Wednesday, the start of class. Mm -hmm. The next upcoming class? Or no, week? no, a week from Wednesday. And that's how I'm going to grade it on those four areas. So you've got a, a week to find the graph you want and uh, do this short analysis of it. I thought you just used that uh, outline guide. No, I wanted to you. Well, I want those headings. I want to see three headings overview, interpretation, and critique. We'll put it in paragraph one at the end. Yes. <coughs> I don't want to see bullet points. I want to see English sentences. Right? Well constructed, hopefully. And don't try to be any flourishy pulp prose or get fancy or BS me. Just good, clear, simple English sentences. All right? Okay, so that's the assignment. Now will take place of the quiz of chapter two. Now let's go ahead and continue. Uh, for a little while longer before we start chapter three in this. Yes? Uh, how do we know it's a, like a chapter quiz review on the oh, oh, stat lab? Ignore those. Inadvertently, when I created your assignments for stat lab, I didn't realize it, but automatically it generated chapter review quizzes. And I went through and I thought I unassigned them, but I'm not going to count them. So, so ignore them. Ignore them. <laughs> I mean, they're, not, they're an opportunity to prepare and study for the work, but I'm not going to look at those scores. Uh, more careful in the future not to inadvertently get those included or cost some confusing. All right. So for a little while longer, let's look at some more examples. And you can practice the skills <coughs> that I want you to use in this assignment. There's a, a great video up on YouTube. See the title, Lies, Damn Lies, and Statistics. Uh, this, well, a woman, uh, I imagine a professional statistician, gives all sorts of examples of really dumb things that have been done. Now here's a pie chart that was displayed on a major news network a year ago, over a year ago. <coughs> and they're talking about the uh, presidential and the primary season. What kind of chart graph is that? <coughs> For example, the pie chart, right? How do you have that? It's on a major <coughs> news program, and the problem is, go ahead. You, you have like however many, that's not 100%, that's not a circle. <laughs> One of the uh, cornerstones of a pie chart is the pieces add up to 100% that, and that's the whole idea behind a part of pie chart. We're taking something and we're dividing it according to a set of categories. And if I sum everything up from each of those categories, I get everything there is and nothing more. What we don't know is the precise question being asked. We can maybe try to guess it and reverse engineer it. But as a presentation of statistics, it's pretty dismal, isn't it? Because when you first saw that, your first impression was, oh, that's a pie chart. Correct. That's what we're being led to believe. But wait, it can't be. Because 70% and 60% and 63%, that, that doesn't work. Uh, maybe they were allowing people to pick multiple ca uh, candidates. So who do you back? Well, I back Palin and Romney. Maybe they could get to a, those numbers that way. But if that's what they asked, they should have displayed data differently. Very, very misleading. Let's look at, it's always fun to criticize other people's stuff, right? A few years ago, a columnist in the Washington Post was studying the amount spent on high school education by different states, and then he compared that with the results they were getting and was considering SAT and ACT scores. So the basic premise of 
being explored here is if you spend more money in education, will your students do better? And better, in this case, was higher SAT and ACT scores. Okay? So, uh, something worth studying. Well, here is a scatter plot of spending per pupil and SAT scores. Right? Scatter plot. We know about scatter plots. We use those to see trends. You have to have pairs of quantitative values. So the pair would be in here someplace would be Virginia. The x value would be how much we spend per student per year in high school. And that would be the average SAT score. All right, this author made this point that, gee, if I look at the states that spent the least, the least on high school education, they had amongst the highest SAT scores. And in particular, New Jersey. Everyone likes to pick on New Jersey. Anyone here from New Jersey? Yes, indeed. All right, you've got to defend yourself now. New Jersey had the highest per pupil expenditures. But when you compare them with uh, uh, North Dakota, you saw the following information. Okay. SAT scores in 1998, I guess it was something like that. Verbal, math for North Dakota, New Jersey, and yet New Jersey was uh, the second from the highest spending per pupil, and North Dakota was the 45th, almost the least money per pupil. What do you think? Pretty conclusive? Yes, uh, Cadet, uh, try to get your names now. Oh, I can't see your tag. Oh, Roscoe. Orozco. Orozco. Uh, you should look the same. What do you think? Convince me. Um, I, I don't think that's correct because North Dakota has uh, less population or it's less um, populated than New Jersey is. So, um, kind of, in spending wise, mm -hmm. it would make sense that North Dakota is not spending as much because they can put the funding towards something else, where New Jersey has a lot more students. That they would have to have per students. Okay, that's that's a good uh, something to check for. Now, are we comparing raw numbers, like an example we've used, you know, VMI versus Virginia Tech? You can't compare raw counts. Or are we comparing comparing ratios or percentages? In this case, what are we doing? We are comparing ratios because it's spending per pupil. So even though you're absolutely right, there's a lot more students in New Jersey than North Dakota, they at least got that right, spending per pupil. If they said overall educational budget, well, that wouldn't make sense to compare that with it. All right, but you're on a trail. Keep following. There's a couple other issues here. What could be going wrong? As an informed skeptic, Petroco, are you a skeptic? Um, well, you circled for us. Yeah, I did. I, I should be standing yeah. here. But. You can't just choose your elite five and report their data. Yeah. I'll get to this point. Even before I get to this point, which is a little bit subtle, at the top level, but if I'm comparing spending per student in New Jersey and North Dakota, that makes sense? Right? They're very similar states, aren't they? What's the, pro what's the problem? Is that different? Besides the fact that um, there's more people in New Jersey, um, North Dakota's a lot larger, so you've got like a widespread amount of populations. And it could be a pretty big population spread over a lot of area. Depends on how built up it is, how much education costs. And that would affect the price per student? Yes. Okay. I can think of some other reasons, though. Differences between New Jersey and North Dakota. What do you think? Where is it most expensive to live? New Jersey. She can attest to that? Taxes. I am sure, I'm sure, listen to me on the statistics, I'm supposed to be open-minded. I'm pretty sure that a, a teacher costs a lot more in New Jersey than in North Dakota. Cost of living is higher. 
Now, what I would want to ask this person is, did you somehow reflect cost of living in these numbers? If North Dakota is spending $5,000 a year, New Jersey is 10000 does that reflect the cost of living? Right? That's one issue. But a more subtle one is this. Are any of you from the Midwest? Any? No? None? All right. I didn't know this until I stumbled across this a couple of years ago. Traditionally, historically, uh, in the Midwest, the ACTs are used, have been used for college entrance exams. And most of you took, did you take SATs or ACTs? Or both? Both. Both. This data is from a bit of a snapshot in time, but here's what was going on at this point in time. If you are a student in the Midwest and applying to Midwest schools, you take the ACT scores, and that would be sufficient. If you're a student in the Midwest and wanted to apply to an Eastern school, especially an elite Eastern school, you would need to take the SATs. 5% of the students in North Dakota took the SATs, 79, almost 80% of New Jersey did. What's wrong with that picture? People are going to school on the East Coast. Yeah, and what about, I mean, we're, we're just being suspicious here. But what's it suspicious? What's it leading us to? The general population of students in New Jersey would be taking the SAT, where in North Dakota, would be the students who are going to higher level schools in the East Coast, and therefore their SAT schools would be higher. Excellent. I mean, that would be my suspicion. And you could, if you dug deeper, you could find that out, couldn't you? Because that would be possible. I mean, look at the GPAs of the students that took this test for this year. But that makes me very suspicious of the claim, and I would say the data that might be accurate. Nothing wrong with the way these numbers were calculated, but they really don't make, support the claim that they're intended to claim. Right? Because what was the, one of the first things we studied? Your samples, are they random? Are they representative? Probably not in this case. Probably not. All right, so hopefully you can find some examples with some really, some biases and some, uh, something we can really sink our teeth into and analyze. All right. I'm going to spend about 10 more minutes giving some more practice on uh, <coughs> using what we've learned, applying it to, to uh, graphical uh, statistics displays. And we want to look at these kinds of questions. I picked a certain topic that's pretty relevant right now. There's a lot in the news about the distribution of wealth in the United States. Now, this is a statistics class. We're not going to discuss whether it's a good thing or a bad thing or what's going to happen about it. All I'm interested in is looking at five different attempts to convey this information. It's kind of complex. And I want you to look at them and critique them. Which ones do you understand the best? Which ones do you think violate some of the principles we've talked about? All right? So here's the first one. Like someone to explain that to, to explain this to you. I can meant to think about it. And what am I looking at? <coughs> Rakowski, can I take a shot at it? Uh, yeah, sure. um, top level of what Americans think it is. It's, uh, Americans think that there's uh, certain classes, many people fit in those classes, but the bottom one, what it really is, is more of like one minimum class, and then the higher class are a lot more to a lot smaller percentages. Okay. The, the first thing, this, this graph is complex, and that's trying to get two messages across at once. That's exactly right. On the top, it's displaying 
information about what Americans think the distribution of wealth is. And on the bottom, it's displaying information on the reality. Okay? It's an ambitious graph. Now given that, how do you how would you comment on how they displayed that information? Anything there you see that we said you should do or you shouldn't do? Do you feel you understand it? Do you understand it? Yeah. What's confusing to you? The graphics, the background. <coughs> do we really need to see Ben Franklin? No. Ben's not helping us understand this. This is an example of using pictographs or as the one person suggested, you're using ink to display something other than the real information. It's a complicated concept talking about distribution of wealth or distribution of things in general. Um, but this is what it's doing. If you took the entire population and you broke it into fits, the top 20%, those that have the top 20% of wealth, the next 20th, the 30th, the 40th, and the 5th. So the, the fifth 20th, which would be the bottom 20%. And if you looked at that bottom 20%, added up all their wealth and see what part of the pie they had, Americans think they have about that much. And they think the top 20% have that much. But in reality, the top 20% have that much. The bottom 20% have that much. <coughs> Did you get that message? No. No? All right. In that case, it failed. I mean, it's a complicated message you're trying to get across to you. Let's look at some other examples. What are we looking at? Distribution of wealth. Okay, what kind of technique? Pie chart. Pie chart. Good old favorite. Does everything add up? Do the pieces of the pie add up? They do. What do the different pieces represent? What are the categories <coughs> of the slice of the pie? The levels of wealth in America. Yeah. Now they <coughs> sliced it up a little bit differently. The previous one took it by 20ths, or 20%. The top 20%, the bottom 20%. This graph sliced up differently. It said, "Here's the top 10%. This is the, this is a category of people, right? And this is the top 1%. One out of 100. Actually, that's the top nine. That's the top 1%. And that is the bottom 50%. And that's the 50th to 90th percent." So what's a little bit confusing here is these pieces, these categories aren't dividing the population up in equal numbers of people, right? But it's on the um, categorizing you based on your wealth. The top 1% of Americans then own this much of the wealth. And the bottom half on that much. Any comments? Not on the meaning of it, but just as a statistical display. Is it better or worse? Better. Better, isn't it? It's a lot simpler. All the ink here has a meaning. I don't have a lot of fancy drawings. It's not as ambitious, is it? It's not trying to give me two messages. It's just a, sim a single message. And what's hard to get your mind around it, in this, in this kind of display, this kind of data, is what the different pieces of a pie represent. I see some grimaces. Technique? 
Bad technique? Confusing? It's easy to understand. It's easy to understand. <laughs> okay. What makes it easy to understand? It's plain. Like, it shows it's what like it's clear. Like the messages. It's very good. You can really see, like, it's not just the numbers. It's just something you know. Okay, and you know the outline of the United States. So what's this graphic relying on? It's your, isn't it your ability to see area? Mm -hmm. The eye visually, you can interpret area real quickly. And you know that, wow, this is a lot, a lot of area. You still have to work to say, well, what about this area? Well, one percent only. It's really not that different than a, a pie chart. They broke it up in just three pieces, and the pie chart had four or five. <coughs> but it's a different display. In this case, do you think using a pictograph, the graphs of the United States, is that good or bad? It's good. It's like with the other pictograph, it was hard to understand because they put more detail into the picture mm -hmm. than what we were looking at. And then here, they kind of just doled out the background to the outline, and they put more detail into the actual information. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this works for most of you. Does help? All right. I think it's that our innate ability to visually look at something, and we're very good at uh, processing the area, areas and colors. How about that one? Yeah. <laughs> What's wrong? We need too much. We need like three glasses. There. Is. At least three, there might be four graphs overlaid at once there. There's a pie chart, which of course they have to make like a hockey puck, three-dimensional, which is unnecessary. All right. And then you have behind it a bar chart, but it looks like they're kind of using a, uh, uh, the midpoints connecting them with the lines. I have time on it also. But the time down here doesn't relate to the time here, I don't think. <coughs> so, if you can explain that to me, I'm impressed. I've looked at it for a few minutes, and I think it's, a, it's an excellent example of how not to do it. Right? It's, you're trying to present far too much information at once. All right, last one. standard approaches, is it? You like it? I saw a thumbs up. All right, tell us. Why did that work for you? Um, I like it because of how simple the visual aspect is. And, you know, it, it explains what, what the graph is pointing towards, you know, with the 100 people and $100 to represent everything. And then the visual aspect with the coins and the dollars just Makes it really easy to understand. Okay. Yeah, and it puts it into values that we understand. We understand money in that that way. So it's easy for us to know like wow, I just compared to areas of black, which would represent well, now it's dollars and cents. I think one other thing they did here is in this kind of problem, this is a challenging statistical problem to talk about this country is struggling to talk about this. But how do you actually describe what's going on in something fairly complicated? They boil it down and say, let's consider 100 people. So we're not talking about the top 1 percentile or the top 20 percentiles, which gets people spitting and you know smoke coming out of ears already. We're saying, here's 100, 100 people in the room. I'm going to pick the one, the wealthy guy, one of them. And she's going to get 34, 60. 
And then uh, eight of you are going to share, uh, share 19 cents each. And then the other 19 in between, they get a, you know, they can buy a latte at Starbucks. All right? Okay. I hope you appreciate now uh, the diversity of statistical graphics out there and how challenging it is to make good ones, particularly <coughs> for the topics that we're, you know, we're discussing in our society and country. It's hard to do it. It's, it's easy to do a poor job of it, let's put it that way. All right? So that gives you some ideas of what I'm looking for in what you provide to me next week. This is kind of thinking. Okay, we don't need that. Oh. Uh, I suppose I should put a plug in as long as I'm at YouTube. YouTube slash user slash VMI or no? <coughs> YouTube slash users? Yeah, YouTube.com slash users. Or just user slash or VML or Oh, I can just search here. Does it? Try with the math lab. I'm not sure if they've indexed this yet. Insert, insert it. Oh, yeah. If you're having trouble sleeping at night, yeah. Major Cohen has, as you would see, been putting these videos on it. The idea is to have them streaming from the uh, VMI, but that's not available yet, so he uploaded, uploaded them to uh, YouTube so they can go viral. I think the best utility would be if you if you miss a class or someone here misses a class because of uh, athletics, or, you know, they're, they're available. Or if you really can't get to sleep at night or you just can't get enough of my voice, go right ahead. Knock yourself out. Reading a class, we're going to start in chapter three. It's the last chapter that will be covered in our test, which is a week from Friday. And now, finally, in statistics class, we're going to get down to calculating numbers. It's about time, huh? We're going to see formulas and mathematical symbols, all that great stuff. We're still in the realm of descriptive statistics, and our goal is to come up with a way to describe data, what's going on. And we'll be looking at describing data in three different ways. Today, we'll get started on a measure of center. We'll talk about that for about a day and a half, and measures of variation. And then we'll conclude with measures of relative standing. Three different ways describe data, and we often use them in conjunction. It's not an either and or. Now what we're going to embark on is we have this goal. I want to characterize or describe a pile of numbers. And how do I describe it? Well, one way, the first way we're going to look at is the center of it, with air quotes and everything else, all right? What do we mean by the center of the data? And we'll come up with four or five different ways of talking about what could be considered the center of the data. But you know, the reality is data sets don't have centers. It's just our concept of where do most of the values lie. All right, I need some data. Quickly calculate your height in inches. Can you 
you should use your TI calculator if you really need to. And I'm going to go by row and we're going to fill it. We're going to be my data set to illustrate some of these things. And I'm going to go, I hope this is inevitable. Ah. I guess I can't get it then. Uh, <coughs> there I can. All right. I'll start with the left hand side and just give me your height in inches. 67. 70. 70. 70. Arnold? Uh, 65. 65. 70. 70. 71. 71. All right. Okay. Yeah, have a one. 73. 3. 70. 70. Uh, 73. 73. 65. 65. 68. 68. 67. 67. All right. Third row. 68. 68. I'm missing this right? Okay. 70. 67. 68. 72. Okay. And the last row. 72. 72. 62. 62. Can I have keys? That's wrong. So we're 72. All right, you're my data set. And I'm interested in then, we're studying your height. How can I measure the center of your data set, your heights? What would that mean? What different approaches can we take? We can do it by row, or do we do it by the whole group? So as we go through these definitions of measures of center, we'll go back and update data here. First measure of center is one that you're familiar with. You can call it the average. We're going to call it the mean from now on. And you'll see why we get to chapter 5. Because uh, <coughs> the meaning of mean in statistics is broader than just the average. The average is one example of how to calculate a mean. There are other means out there for different kinds of data. All right, finally I get to write some mathematical symbols. <coughs> you need to add these to your vocabulary and become proficient in using them because this is our language from here on out. This is a, a capital sigma, a capital Greek letter. You, you may have seen it before. <coughs> it means add these things up. And the things you add up are what you put next to it. And it's understood that I'll take all of these and I'll add them together. <coughs> well, x is the very what we often use to represent what it is we're measuring. So in my example here, we're going to study your heights. X would be a height of any one of you. And since I've got more than one, to distinguish them, I'll often use a subscript. I'll say X sub I. And that just is a way of counting. So Mikowski could be X sub one, the student X sub two, and so on way to keep you separate. Well, I've got a big N and a little n. The little n is going to represent my sample size. And the big N is my population. <coughs> now, this all depends on the context, doesn't it? If I'm studying just this section 105, then big N is uh, 
21. So if, if I'm working with a row at a time, and I'm working with the first row, little n would be 5. Samples versus populations. We're going to need to be very careful about that distinction. X bar, which is the sample mean, pronounce it X bar, and that's the sample mean, it's calculated by just sigma X sub i over small n. And that's just your arithmetic average. U which is the population mean, is the sum of x sub i over big N, which is the population. The population. So I can have a mean height for the first row, or I can have a mean height for the whole class. If it's the whole class and near my population, that would be a mu. The mean height of the row would be an x bar. It's a sample. Now you might be saying, why are we making this distinction? It's incredibly important. In 105, particularly 106, so um, I guess get used to it. We have to be clear at what we're talking about, whether it's a sample of the population. X bars and mu's. All right, well, the mean then is just one way we can measure the center of a group of data, uh, data points. What's good about it and what's bad about it? And you're going to see in all of these statistics that we come up with, there are pros and cons, and you need to know what they are. One good thing about the sample mean is it uses all of the data points. It's kind of obvious, isn't it? But if I'm going to calculate your mean height of this class, I use every one of your heights. It sounds kind of obvious, but there are other measures of center that don't do that. That's a good thing. Now here's the flip side. It's also a bad thing. We don't have any outliers here, but if we had a seven foot one center from the football team in the class, that person's data value would be added into the <laughs> mean and that would greatly influence the mean. So the mean is sensitive to outliers. That's something you just need to be aware of. Back to life. And the first point here is, I can't prove it to you right now, but I think it's intuitively obvious. I hope it is that means, if I calculate means from different samples, they tend to be pretty similar numbers. We're going to calculate on uh, Wednesday here the means by rows. And they're not going to be wildly different. And that's a good property. Because if you think out in the real world when I'm taking samples and I'm calculating statistics, I don't want the value of the statistic to be wildly dependent on my sample. <coughs> and how would I know if I'm, what the true uh, population value is. Each time I take a sample, I get a real different number. The means are kind of stable in that sense, and that's a good thing. And, all right, there's how you can calculate <coughs> the mean in a number of chocolate chips and a chip avoid cookie. I don't have any cookies here, sorry. <coughs> One last thought, then we'll call it a day. Here's an example where means can be greatly impacted by outliers. Simple data sets of just five values. Notice they're identical for the first four. And the fifth value of the first sample is, is 90, and down here it's 900. This will be an outlier. Look what happens to the mean. It jumps from 50 to 212. Big difference. Now, you as a statistician you have to make a judgment. Do I 
really keep this data value? Is it representative? Is this what my population is like, or is this just an aberration? Now, the third sample, its mean is pretty close to the first sample, but look at the values. They're quite different. They're more bunched together, aren't they? They don't vary as much. That's something we'll get to later. And we'll see that just a mean by itself, a measure of center by itself, can be misleading. You need to have more information. All right, I'll leave you with that thought. See you later.